Episode 160 of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you in part by FreshBooks with a 30-day unrestricted free trial available to you right now. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. We've become particularly adept at being able to shift to different types of perspectives. We've become really great at creative problem solving. We're going to come up with more ideas. The ideas are going to be better. And we're really going to see this manifold increase in our performance. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Hi, and welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to your personal and professional growth, where, of course, leadership gets a lot of focus here. We also talk about things like personal development, productivity, career, business, marketing, sales, entrepreneurship, and today, innovation. In a moment, you and I are going to be joined by Adam Hansen. He's the co-author of Outsmart Your Instincts. How the Behavioral Innovation Approach Drives Your Company Forward. I'll be asking Adam about what it is about our ancestry that makes it hard for us to naturally innovate, the power of pretending when it comes to innovation, plus we'll dig into cognitive bias issues like negative availability and confirmation bias, and much, much more. If you missed out a few weeks ago on the chance to become a charter member of the Read to Lead University Book Club, all is not lost. In case you're not even sure what that is, let me just fill you in. The Read to Lead University Book Club is right now a group of 50 Read to Lead listeners passionate like you about the books they read with a desire to read even more. And not only that, probably more importantly, to apply what they're learning to make the world around them better. We read a new book together each month with a chance to discuss what we're reading as we're reading it in our private Facebook group. And at the end of each month, we come together virtually to dive into it even more. And sometimes we're even joined by the author, him or herself. And on an ongoing basis, I also share other reading and book related resources. Registration is not open right now, but it will be opening again very, very soon to just 50 more People, if you'd like to be on the short list and get an invitation when registration again opens, there's two ways you can handle that. You can either go to readtoleaduniversity.com and enter your first name and email address there. Or if you're in the States, simply text the word university to 33444. And this episode of the Read to Lead podcast would not be possible without our friends at cloud accounting software FreshBooks. They are helping to offset the production costs associated with producing Read to Lead each week. And when you take advantage of that free trial they've got going on right now, you're casting a vote for Read to Lead. You're saying to FreshBooks that their sponsorship matters to you and also that it's working, which is important to them. (laughs) There's no obligation as part of this free trial, and I highly recommend it, especially if you work for yourself, you're a freelancer. With the growth of the internet, there's never been more opportunities for folks who want to be self-employed or uh, even those who are just looking to create a side hustle. You've got to have a way to invoice your clients. Well, to meet that need, FreshBooks has launched an all-new version of their cloud accounting software. It's been redesigned from the ground up and custom built for exactly the way you and I work. If you're looking for the simplest way to be more productive, more organized, and to get paid faster then this is it. The all-new FreshBooks is not only ridiculously easy to use, it is packed with some pretty powerful features. I think you'll agree. You can create and send professional-looking invoices in just a few seconds. I've tried this. When I say just a few seconds, I mean just a few seconds. You can set up online payments with just a couple of clicks and get paid, a FreshBooks says, up to four days faster. I know I get paid faster using FreshBooks. You can see when your client has seen and or viewed an invoice, which puts an end to a lot of the guessing games, which I love. FreshBooks is offering that 30-day unrestricted free trial right now. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash read to lead. 
Adam Hansen is VP Innovation and Innovation Process Consultant at ideas to go and a career-long innovation leader, student, and devotee. And I have got to figure out a way to get devotee uh, into my personal bio. I got, I, Adam, you're going <laughs> to have to help me on that one. Uh, he, he has served on the board of the Product Development and Management Association and as an innovation and strategy expert with select causes in education and healthcare. And Adam has co-authored a new book along with Beth Storrs and Ed Harrington called Outsmart Your Instincts, How the Behavioral Innovation Approach Drives Your Company Forward. Adam, it's a pleasure. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. Jeff, thank you very much. I'm excited to be with you today. Well, I wanted to start by asking you something I hadn't initially planned, but tell me a little bit about your history, uh, particularly in grad school and something that a professor said that sort of set you on a, on a new course. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, I had determined to be a product management, uh, focus. That was in English. Was that I determined <laughs> to have, I determined to have a product management focus as I worked on my MBA degree at uh, Indiana university down in Bloomington, Indiana. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I knew just from, you know, knowing myself and, and kind of seeing where my interests, you know, tended to go, that when I took the new product development and innovation class, that I was really, really going to enjoy it. But I assumed that that would just be kind of, you know, the typical, you know, thing you punch on your career and you spend maybe three or four years there. But when my professor, uh, Tom Hustad, who then went on to become a, a really wonderful mentor and friend, made the case that one could do an entire career in innovation, which mm. was news to uh, the naive kid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just remember it really was one of those, those light bulb moments for me. Mm. And I just remember thinking, man, if you really could do that your entire career, why would you not do that? And so I've been very fortunate that my entire career, first on the client side and then now with ideas to go, uh, has always just been focused on innovation, new product development, new service development, new ways of talking about, um, you know, either products or services, et cetera. And Ideas to Go is a company that's been around for, for quite a long time, right? Yeah, we're in our 38th year. Wow. Well, Adam and his, his colleagues contend that our natural instincts often don't do us a lot of good when it comes to innovation. Uh, so, Adam, fill us in. What is it about our ancestry that, that throws a wrench in this wheel? Yeah, this this whole idea was first kind of tough for me to embrace because I think of myself as this very intuitive guy who, yes, I want to see the data, mm. but then I, I want to get on it. You know, it's like <laughs> enough data. I understand, you know, notions of analysis, paralysis and everything. But getting back to this idea of, of some instincts really working at cross purposes to our to our efforts uh, we know the tendency to fight the last war, right? I mean, that's a common expression. So even with the Blitzkrieg in World War II, the Allies took a long time to challenge some assumptions from World War I, et cetera. That's obviously not just isolated to military thought and action. Our bodies and minds are in important ways still adapted for the needs of millennia ago. Uh, so, for example, caloric scarcity is, is not the problem now. Mm. Uh, but our body still metabolizes if that were so, and the ready abundance of calories now is what has you know, <laughs> m- most of us in trouble. Right. Um, and so there, there's a, there's a little bit of a mismatch there, and our, our bodies need to catch up somehow. But you know, through behavior and awareness, we can do something about it. In our minds, the same thing: non-conscious shortcuts that made surviving efficient for our ancestors now confront entire, entirely new challenges and are, are consequently poorly matched to them. The fact that they're non-conscious makes them tricky because we're good <laughs> at figuring out smart sounding rationale after the fact to cover the impulses that, that we're just not aware of. And we can, we can make up the story as to why we did what we what we did. Uh, but the great news is with some awareness, a little bit of diligence and a helpful framework, uh, we can mitigate the harshest effect of, uh, of this mismatch. Well, uh, speaking of which, let's, let's dig into some of these, these biases, these cognitive biases uh, of innovation. I want to start with, with probably uh, the most common uh, negative bias, this, this idea that bad is, is stronger than good. Help us wrap our heads around that. 
Yeah, so uh, this is a fun one. And we, and we talk about this first because if we don't solve for it, we don't have to worry <laughs> about some of, the, some of the other ones that much. All right. But uh, think back to your ancestors who were faced with some variant on this. Uh, the specifics were different, but the, the same basic setup. There was a rustle in the bushes, but hey, it sounds different from any other rustle I've ever heard, heard before. So right at that moment, the inquisitive types would have gone to investigate Still with some awareness. I mean, they, you know, will trust that they weren't entirely foolhardy, mm-hmm. but but not knowing was something they didn't like, right? So we can guess what immediately happened to their odds of sticking around long enough to pass on their DNA <laughs> the moment they start walking toward this thing, you know, this unknown. Mm-hmm. So those who took immediate action and didn't especially care to satisfy their curiosity, if any hint of threat existed are the ones that we call our great, 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 you can see where this is going, grandparents, right? <laughs> right. So we are, we really are the descendants of the savants of risk aversion mm-hmm. who, who labeled all novelty first and foremost as threat, and then only later, if, if it was proven not to be a threat, well then great. But yeah. at least, at least right. I, I, sur- I survived to find that out. I didn't have to place myself at, at existential risk to find that out. So negativity bias is our non-conscious starting point. We come by it honestly. We don't have to fault anyone for it. Uh, all of us have it, so we can't you know, be judgmental about it. We just need to know what's going on. But the vexing part as well here, Jeff, is that uh, the research shows, and, and our experience probably bears out, that those who are really negative seem smart, they seem profound, they mm. seem wise, they seem really adult, business-like. Whoever can most quickly slice and dice any new and perfect idea, I always kind of go, oh, you know. But it's, it's, easy, it's easy to understand why that might be in there as well, because keeping us away from harm was, was job number one way back when. So, But the idea that neg- negativity bias is both this automatic reflexive thing and at the same time seems really smart, well, that, that's just great that we're just – irrational critters. <laughs> I, I can't count the number of times in, in a meeting when I worked a traditional job, how many times I uttered the phrase, well, let's, let's err on the side of caution here. You know, let's, let's be, <laughs> let's be careful. I, mean, I was always the one uh, quick to, uh, you know, pick things apart, pick, you know, I was sort of playing devil's advocate. And, and I think that did make me feel smarter. I, you know, the, the, I was the guy oftentimes who was quick to do that. And so th- this was very eye opening for me. I, I'm not uh, as much like that anymore. Thank Thankfully, in large part because of the the level of reading that I do, and, and your book certainly helps with that. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, it's all about time and place. Critical thinking, be able, being able to isolate deficiencies and problems with things, mm. is fantastic. We're simply saying because that's automatic, you can always come back to it. Just don't necessarily go there first when you're performing certain tasks because yeah. it's not helpful. Well, there's there's an exercise early in the book that is, that is super helpful called the Forness Response, uh, F O R N E S S. And Adam, can you describe that for us? Maybe demonstrate it in action. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it really focuses in on the word for. So forness is admittedly kind of a clunky term, but at least because of its maybe because of its clunkiness, it's <laughs> memorable. But what it does is it gets back to this idea that we are going to go absent any effort or or direction, it, it, we're just going to go straight to what we don't like in a new in a new idea. My hobby is is music, and I get to you know play live every now and again. Mm. My bandmates uh, years ago, this is probably 10, 12 years ago, we got to play at this resort south of Orlando. Brand new ballroom. We were really stoked. <laughs> I mean, it's really get, really going to be fun. And we walk in to set up to do the sound check and you know get everything set up. And my eye, upon entering the room, my eye was instantly drawn to the chipped ceiling tile in the far corner. <laughs> now, Yeah, I didn't go in there with the idea that I was going to try to figure out what was bad about the venue. It's kind of almost at, again, cross purposes with our, even our own welfare. So, (laughs) so this is, Fornis is about how to value ideas early on, more for their provocative value than necessarily for their immediate merits. So negativity bias will drive us straight to what we don't like about a new idea. So we'll choose not to go to what we don't like about it first and Mm -hmm. consider what we are for in the idea and do some serious digging on that and try to get beyond just the most obvious and superficial response on that side. And then after doing that, our mind is actually in a better state. We've actually primed our mind to deal now with the problems in a much better way and with some helpful language 
like I wish to, I wish for, how might we, we can then focus in on what we wish for. So it's what you're for and what you wish for. It's not pros and cons. Mm. It's just that twist on it that we find to be really helpful because it's more generative. You'll actually come up with more ideas. So we like to show in training with clients that even an, an absurd idea can be the wellspring for lots of great ideas and really can have value. Mm. It's almost like the idea per se isn't the thing. It's how you process it. If you focus first on what you're for and then go to what you wish for, that's really helpful. So let's let, let's play. Let's okay. let's uh, let's imagine we're doing this with read to lead. All right. OK. All right. So I'm going to throw out an absurd idea. <laughs> so uh, Jeff Brown is now going to abduct listeners and make them read the 10 best books of the year <laughs> over a two week period. Uh, that idea, I will acknowledge, is illegal, unethical, <laughs> potentially dangerous. Uh, I'd never seriously endorse this as a winning idea, but it can be a helpful starting point, again, if we if we process it the right way. Mm. So I'll tell you, Jeff, one thing I'm for in that idea, uh, and then you tell me something that you're for. So okay. I, I find the idea of curation, that you, uh, your perspective, Jeff, your perspective in seeing a lot more books than most of your listeners mm. – really leads to some wisdom and that perspective can be particularly valuable in the 10 that you select. And yeah, for, for me, one of the first things I thought of is, is if you're a listener of the show, you obviously enjoy or, or want to do more and more reading. And these 10 books are books that you'd love to get to, but you may not be able to otherwise. So this is a way to sort of make sure that in a very short period of time, you're going to do something that is going to benefit you long after these two weeks of, of hell or whatever they might be. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I love how you're, I love how you're playing with it because the idea that you're going to now commit a major felony, uh, doesn't seem like a great starting point normally. Right. Right. And so another thought is just, Hey, look, if I've already been abducted, it's only going to be two weeks. Maybe Jeff is kind enough to tell me, uh, so I've got skin in the game. I, I might as well just go for it and commit to it and really see if I can't get a lot done. It's weird that he abducted me, but it seems <laughs> like it could be for a good purpose. And as much as I might not like it at first, Hey, I'll swing with it. Okay. <laughs> so that's just, that's just an example when you consider it for what it's for and try to expose any value in there and not being too literal. Mm. You know, we're, again, we're not endorsing felony. Uh, that's great. And now I'm thinking about it differently. So now I can go to the the uh, obvious issues with this with this idea and using language like what I wish for or how might we or what if we, etc. I would say I, I wish to raise the emotional stakes on my own self development. Mm. Yeah, you know, perhaps without the trauma of being abducted, even by <laughs> even by someone as nice as Jeff. <laughs> Well, one of the things that I'm always uh, keying in on is uh, related to that is is helping people bridge the gap between intention and implementation or taking what you're learning and not just learning it, but actually doing something with it. So finding ways to apply. So I wish to find ways to apply what I'm learning from from read to lead. Would that would that be along the along the right I, lines? I, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. So on the wish for side, you're using anything that the idea has done for you to jostle mm. your thinking loose of, you know, a whole bunch of assumptions. And you don't have to be especially loyal to this particular mm. idea and try to make it a better idea. Because admittedly, this is a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but once we just go to this entirely new context now for for the relationship between you, your audience, books, etc. It just really gets us thinking a lot of things that we never would have otherwise. And so it's not the idea per se that we're talking about, but how we treat it. We appreciate ideas more for their provocative value early on than necessarily for their immediate merits. Mm. And that's the approach we'd ask more people to take. And there's a time and place for this. And you don't want to do this you know, always forever. But the more you practice it, it just becomes just like anything else. All skill acquisition is going from, you know, hard effort to habitual, right? Right. And so if you just practice this, it really does become a mindset. And we love it when our clients say, yeah, you know, that foreignness thinking thing, we first thought it was kind of goofy and dorky and everything, but we actually conduct our meetings now by it. And someone can't just say what they don't like, they have to tee it up in terms of I wish for, how might we, what if we, because I don't like that doesn't contain a whole lot of information necessarily, <laughs> right? Right. And so that's that's what the whole approach mm -hmm. is about. 
And I, I liked the example from the book, too, with a hat tip to, uh, I guess it is uh, Steve Martin and, and the, <laughs> the bathroom or kitchen sink lined with, with fur. That's the idea you start with. And then uh, Adam and his co-authors walk you through this exercise using that as, as the starting point. To me, that was just a very um, a fascinating process to go through and to, and to kind of see what ideas something like a fur-lined sink w- would lead you to. Uh, it, it sounds absurd at the outset, but but what comes from that, because of how you're you're approaching it, is oftentimes some pretty awesome ideas. Yeah, and then in modeling it with an absurd idea, it makes the point, again, that you're rarely going to confront the most absurd ideas, right. but even if you do, you can do this. And so ideas that it's it's are easy to dismiss, maybe even for much smaller reasons, you're going to be more careful with that, and you're not going to be so quick just to write them off. You're going to mm-hmm. say, no, what what is helpful here? What is interesting? Uh, has value. And then I can go to work on the issues with it in a very different way that's, again, more generative and not just shutting down thinking. Well, let's jump ahead here. Another bias talked about in the book, among several, is availability bias, which is about the the shortcut our brain takes to help us make decisions more efficiently. But the problem, uh, Adam says, though, is emotion trumps reason when availability bias is at play. Can you expound on that, Adam? Yeah, absolutely. So this is in, uh, in his work, Daniel Kahneman talked about system one and system two thinking. So system one is this very fast, kind of impulsive. It's, it's actually where we make uh, the, the mode from which we make most of our decisions. System two is that effortful, deliberative, mm-hmm. has to kind of be coaxed into, uh, into action. So all the cognitive biases are seated in system one, this, this fast thinking. Mm. And availability bias is the idea that when we're confronted with a decision or, you know, we just have to think through something, we'll always just go to what we can most quickly summon in our memory or or just even in our immediate environment, whether or not those inputs are the most helpful ones, you know. Mm. And so because we're emotional, what we dredge up to, to help us here is going to be skewed because negativity bias, you know, we'll think of more negative things. It will tend more toward caution and risk aversion and everything because some of the other biases will make the mistake of thinking through our previous experience with something like this before. It truly is representative of how it is for everyone else in the world. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and Daniel Kahneman calls this bias, his language for it is what we see is all there is because that's how we actually act. That's how, how in some important ways, how we actually think. And we know that's that's just absolutely not the case. And so taking a little more effort to get some additional stimuli in uh, is really important. And that doesn't need to be a research study. That doesn't need to be anything more than maybe even a 10-minute exercise sometimes. And again, for most of the decisions we make, no problem. We don't have to do it. Uh, the stakes are low, big deal. If we're buying green beans in the grocery store, you know, we're, we're not going <laughs> to... We're not going to stop to try to come up with a lots of different considerations as to why one brand might not might be better than another. Mm. But just being reflective and again understanding that these biases are there, they are non-conscious, and that's why they're kind of tricky. But that we can do something about them uh, is really helpful. W- would you say, Adam, that system two thinking, this reflective, more conscious thinking, is this akin to uh, mindfulness? thinking? Well, mindfulness is, is really overall just a wonderful practice for mm. health and, and well-being and everything. So I'll, I'll be the first to endorse that broadly. Mm. The way to think about system two is think of any talent that you have. Mm-hmm. So Jeff, in, in your experience as a musician, when you first picked up the horn, if your experiences were like mine, man, it sounded pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. no, I had the opposite experience. So. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, you're great from the start. Oh, no, fantastic. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Oh, you're the you're the one. Okay, great. <laughs> but system two is how any skill is acquired. Mm. We first start off, you know, fumbling and faulty, and it's effortful. And you know, think of um, the first time you pulled onto the freeway in driver's ed. Oh boy. <laughs> and you know, like every sense is pressed into high alert, mm. and you're hyper vigilant, and it's absolutely exhausting. And and we just can't we can't spend. Uh, much of our time in that mode because, you know, we would sleep, uh, you know, 15 hours a day instead of, you know, <laughs> se- seven to eight. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's what's going on with system two. It's, it is effortful. It does need to be coaxed into action because we're lazy. Mm. 
And it's not really just that we're lazy, it's we like to conserve energy because millennia ago, conserving energy was really important because we need to be able to run from the threat <laughs> in, in case it ever came up. The tiger, what have you. <laughs> yeah. And when when all threat is first and foremost considered tiger, <laughs> then, then, then you need to be ready. Well, can, can you address the, the power of pretending or, or role play when it comes to innovation, Adam? Yeah. Uh, so some really great research showing that pretending, doing some role play now, I'm going to be you know, the king of, uh, you know, France, you know, whatever, uh, to, to just even on an off topic problem and kind of playing it through and doing some creative problem solving, it, again, it tees up the mind. It it, um, it gets your, your, it lights up different parts of the brain. Mm. And so this shift in perspective is how elegance and thought can emerge. And so we know that, uh, you know, empathy is a particularly helpful shift in perspective. And so that's just one example of, hey, when we can, you know, going beyond just kind of sympathy and acknowledging that, hey, that, that gee, that looks like a problem I feel so bad. Empathy really is, no, I really get that because whether or not I've actually been in it with some reflection, I can I can actually start to see what this might be like for you. Yeah. So that it, that's just one great example of shift in perspective. But when we do that, and we've become particularly adept at being able to shift to different types of perspectives, we become really great at creative problem solving. We're going to come up with more ideas. The ideas that we come up with are going to be better. And we're really going to see just kind of this this uh, this manifold increase in our performance. Uh, one of the examples I love from the book, I think it was North Dakota State University. It gave two groups of adult graduate students the same instruction. In other words, both groups were told, hey, school is canceled. You have the entire day to yourself. What would you do? Where would you go? Who would you see? But one of the two groups, that statement was preceded by the words, you're seven years old. <laughs> and I was really fascinated about, about the creativity, the level of creativity with that second group just because of that one sentence. Yeah, we always think in terms of context, and we can't, we can't not do that. I mean, we, it, it thought makes no sense. So all thought is uh, concept. All concept comes from some sort of analogy or frame um, or, or situation in which we're placing it. Mm. And so taking a moment even to make, again, a subtle shift, something as easy as that really has an impact on, on what the results are of our effort. Well, I'm going to jump ahead a few chapters here. Talk about the false confidence, Adam, we can fall victim to when confirmation bias is at play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this notion of false confidence, unearned confidence. Think, <laughs> th think of uh, Michael Scott, uh, the character from the U.S. version yes. of The Office, or, or any Will Ferrell character ever. Frequently wrong, never in doubt. Um, <laughs> It, it, it's, it's actually on the Hanson family uh, crest, but uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's this idea that once we have made a decision or are even leaning in one decision in one direction, and what, what the research shows is you've really actually made the decision, you just haven't admitted it to yourself yet. <laughs> but once we're there, we will again non-consciously. So we need to be. We need to know this is going on. We will privilege any information, anything that seems to support what we already believe to be true, and we'll figure out somehow how the disconfirmatory evidence. Uh, well, I see how normally that might be a thing, but in this case, it doesn't really work because of X, Y, and Z. We're so good at rationalizing and at, at kind of post hoc. Uh, coming up with the with the really smart sounding story as to why things happen and and why we make decisions that we make. So confirmation bias is just that. And by being aware that we're prone to it, we can then start to do some things about it. So I mean, I, I won't go very far with this because it's such a, a touchy issue. But everyone, you know, think about your social media feeds for mm -hmm. just a moment, <laughs> and and uh, you know, we'll wisely step away from the political or, or anything else, but. There's a real issue of us surrounding ourselves with people who think an awful lot like we do and, mm -hmm. and then tend to ratchet that confirmation bias up, you know, even more so. So, right. uh, again, all tools have no valence <laughs> per se, but it's how you use them. Fire can uh, burn down houses or it can cook our meals. But, you know, social media, this is not um, weighing in against social media because I love social media and it's, it's been able, it's, it's really helped me do a lot of fantastic things. But um, 
we need, again, it's just being more conscious and aware of how we're using some of these things. And so the thing to have in mind is when something comes up that is disconfirmatory, don't do the immediate fast thinking response and try to figure try try to figure out why that can't be the case. Mm. What value, if any, might there be there? Now, sometimes there's none, and that's fine. But at least if you perform the effort to to reflect on it for at least a moment, usually you can get some helpful nuance. And if anything, it can make where you are, where you where you've already decided to be, uh, it can actually make your case stronger if you'll if you'll actually take on some of the disconfirmatory stuff and and um, and be thoughtful about it. Mm. And Adam, if you would expound on this idea presented near the end of the book of of, of framing, uh, wh- when does that come in? How does that come into play? Yeah, framing is the idea that um, we can't take in all the stimuli that come toward us. We have a very fine tuned feature of our cognition called the reticular formation that's very helpful, and it's actually what keeps us sane. Uh, <laughs> those who those who don't have a, a well formed reticular formation and, and can't frame things well can't shut out most of the information coming their way, most of the stimuli coming their way, well, they have various diagnoses that make them make it hard for them to, <laughs> to, be, to be effective in society. And so we just need to be aware of how things are presented to us. May not be the only way, and not may not, they just aren't the only way in which you can think about them. Mm. And that just even sometimes a subtle shift in some of the language around it can open things up and get us thinking about it differently. And again, it's back to this notion of a shift in perspectives and getting good at that really does lead to elegance and thought. And I don't mean elegance in terms of, um, you know, white tie and, you know, <laughs> ho, 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 but just uh, just more of effectiveness and, and, and simplicity on the other side of complexity. And so just being aware that we only think in terms of frames, but we can choose our frames. It would be kind of the headline here. Right, right. Well, I want to ask some questions that are not directly related to the book. But before I do that, Adam, is there anything else from the book you want to make sure we, we walk away with? Yeah, the, the, to boil it down, we have these biases. We all have them. We're in it together uh, at certain points in putting this together. I just thought, holy smokes, it's amazing we get anything done. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, yay, human spirit. But the great news is with some awareness and then having a framework to, to deal with these and, and some very simple tools, nothing that we talk about in the book is so elaborate that uh, anyone reading the book would not be able to do it. And if you, if you think it is, please send me a tweet get a hold of me and we'll we'll talk you through it. But that's the takeaway. Yes, it's a problem, but it's solvable and we're all in it together, so let's kind of, you know, lock arms and <laughs> and march <laughs> forward, you know, as as we get after it. Well, in addition to being a writer, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume you enjoy reading as well. De- definitely. Definitely. Good, good. Think about yeah. the books you've enjoyed over the years, Adam. What would you say are the the two or three that uh, come immediately to mind as having had the biggest impact on you? Yeah, I would say um, this is both personally and, but I, I've been able to translate it to my work because I think I got lucky enough to really um, kind of erode the wall between those two things. I mean, I've, I'm in, fortunately in a job that is the closest connection to who I actually am mm-hmm. as I've ever, ever had. And so I feel I, I, I'm, I'm, it's not lost on me how lucky I am. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I take some real uh, I, I take that seriously, but the book I it's for somehow I don't even know how I first came aware of it, but it was way back when, back in the Pleistocene era, <laughs> um, I became aware of this book called "If You Want to Write" by Brenda Euland, U E L A N D, and uh, it's this fantastic book, and it hit me at a time that I really needed. To hear it, and the basic premise is: you can take out the word "write" and put in just kind of any creative endeavor. Okay. It doesn't matter. So, if you want to paint, if you want to, it's just if you want to create is really the better. Mm. If I were to give it a new title, it'd be that. This book was written in the late '30s, oh, wow. <laughs> and and some of her advice seems so prescient. And and now it seems like a lot of people have really kind of picked up on some of the basic themes of it. But it's this idea of really getting to know yourself well and have, you know, trying to get as rid of as many illusions about yourself as you can, but then honoring what your 
strengths are, honoring what your interests are, and just getting after the business of creating based on you doing your thing. Mm. And I've I come back to reread it probably every you know three years or so. So now this is too many years, mm. uh, but so I've been through it you know probably approaching now ten times. Wow. Uh, and just absolutely profound. Um, so that that's one that, that that's the deep cut, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on, on the playlist here. Right. Uh, one that's blowing my mind right now, and that I can't recommend highly enough. And and if uh, I don't know if he's on your radar, but Ed Hess and Catherine Ludwig. Uh, Ed's written several books that I just think are fantastic, but the newest one is called "Humility Is the New Smart," and uh, he's a professor at the Darden School at the University of Virginia. I just think the work he's doing is absolutely essential. I think more people need to be aware of his thought, and uh, it's the book that lately uh, I think I've actually hawked it much more than uh, my own book. <laughs> <In> your own <laughs> book. <laughs> Well, that says a lot about it then, for sure. Well, I know you uh, do quite a few workshops. Are, are, are you active uh, on the speaking circuit beyond that? Or do you do a lot of public speaking or no? Uh, a fair amount. And we, we, get, uh, we get really great feedback from conferences when we speak oh, uh, yeah. and you know, some of the innovation conferences and everything. And I think it's because I'm, I'm trying not to be too cheeky and too reductive here, but uh, even at innovation conferences, you can go to some, they're just so dry and and it's just this recitation of research. And mm. and my, my question is, you, you know, aren't you aware that your audience is actually human? I mean, what, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing? Come on. Just, and it's not like for me, there doesn't have to be this huge gulf between how you present mm. And how you have a great conversation. Now, you want to be more thoughtful and everything. You do want to do some degree of scripting and outlining and everything. But, I mean, you are there to serve. And so it's not just about you. It's not just about, hey, you know, song and dance and everything. But you want to, you know, you're there to serve them. So, you know, I'll use language like this. I don't care. Love them. You know, love them. <laughs> mm. Have some fun with it. Remember that you're human and you can cut through to them with some humility, some humanity. And really with the spirit of service and, and really wanting them to walk away with something that is really helpful and is going to make a difference for them. Well, I know you're, you're making the rounds. You've done your share of interviews, as are, uh, I assume, Edward and Beth along with you. But what would, what would you say is next for you? What are, what are you and your team working on now that, that you're excited about? Well, a couple of things. This, uh, this whole area of behavioral innovation is how we talk about the effort here in the book. But there's a lot there. And we've had some great relationships with, for example, the, the Yale Center for Customer Insight. Uh, that relationship will continue. There's more work. I'm already starting the early outlining for book two. But then I'm also our VP of innovation. And so right. uh, trying, to, trying to get the innovation pipeline internally going. There's one offering that we're going to have coming out. I don't know exactly how we're going to play it in terms of the big public launch. But mid-year hmm. and going into the fall, we're going to have some pretty cool news, something that we're very excited about. It's a, it's a web-based service, but that addresses some of the real needs that our clients have had, uh, particularly in the upfront part, even preceding ideation. It's mm -hmm. how to it's how to think about opportunity areas uh, much more richly and and in a way that is uh, holistic, not you know kind of this atomistic you know research here, this thing over there. It kind of connects the dots better. Mm. Well, the book, again, is called Outsmart Your Instincts, How the Behavioral Innovation Approach Drives Your Company Forward, co-written by Beth Stores, Ed Harrington, and our guest today, Adam Hansen. Adam, again, thank you for your time and attention today. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Jeff, an absolute pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. If you'd like to connect with Adam on social media, we put links to his Twitter and LinkedIn profiles on the show notes page created just for this episode. That's also where you'll find links to the books that he referenced, of course, his own book and any of the other resources that we talked about. Just go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash 160 for episode 160. Show our sponsor some love when you take advantage of that free month-long trial from FreshBooks, freshbooks.com slash read to lead for more information on that. If you're not currently subscribed to the podcast, I hope you'll do that soon in iTunes, Stitcher, or your app of choice. 
and rate and review us while you're there, too, if you don't mind. I want to say thanks to both Muhammad and to Adam for their recent five-star ratings and written reviews. Read to lead podcast.com slash iTunes to visit us there or read to lead podcast.com slash Stitcher. Well, that does it for this week, and I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read to Lead.